How's everybody doing? Welcome back to another episode of The Banker Next Door. I am your host, Dr. Joe Berkowitz. This is the weekly banking update, the flagship show of this podcast. And I hope everyone is having it had a wonderful week, is having a great weekend. And uh, we are going to jump right into some of the current banking news and things that are coming up for this coming week. So I'm going to start with uh, economic reports to come out this week. So Monday, we have the manufacturing PMI and we get the ISM manufacturing PMI. On Tuesday, we get factory orders. We get the jolts job openings and we get the API weekly crude oil stock. On Wednesday, June 5th, we are going to get the ADP non-farm employment change. We're going to get the services PMI. On Thursday, we are going to get the continuing jobless claims, initial jobless claims, and then non-farm productivity uh, quarter over quarter. And then we're going to get trade balance. And then on Friday the 7th, we are going to get average hourly earnings. We are going to get non-farm payrolls, unemployment rate, uh, U.S. Baker Hughes total rate count, and we're going to get consumer credit. So going to get a lot of employment data information this week. We got a, we got a lot of uh, so we got a lot of inflation data this past week, but then this week coming up, we're going to get a lot of the employment data. So we'll get a little bit more of the picture overall to kind of put together there on the economic indicators. And I'll kind of talk about that more in a minute. But first, I want to get to some of the headlines for some of the other things that are out there right now. So uh, just an update, if everybody has followed the crypto series that I've done. I did an episode uh, maybe about a month or so ago about on the uh, a bank in Kansas that had failed and with the CEO. And basically what happened this week was the former CEO of failed Kansas bank admits to embezzling millions of dollars. So the former CEO of Elkhart, Kansas-based Heartland Tri-State Bank, which failed in July of 2023, admitted to using his role as a bank executive, the CEO, to embezzle millions of dollars. So Shan Haynes pled guilty to one count of embezzlement by a bank officer, the U.S. Attorney's Office for the District of Kansas, said in a May 23rd news release, citing court documents. From May of 2023 to July of 2023, Haynes initiated 10 outgoing wire transfers totaling $47.1 million of Heartland Tri-State Bank's funds to multiple cryptocurrency accounts controlled by unidentified third parties, according to the news release. The former executive is scheduled to be sentenced on August 8th and faces up to 30 years in prison. Um, on July 28th of 2023, the Kansas Office of the State Banking Commission closed Heartland Tri-State Bank and appointed the FDIC as receiver. Um, so uh, just again, just kind of an update on that. You know, we were kind of wondering you know, what was going on there? Like, did this guy get blackmailed? Did he kind of, you know, did he, you know, did he get involved in some kind of a crypto scam? But it, it looks like he was just, it looks like he was just trying to embezzle the money and funnel it through crypto accounts. But the interesting thing is that the crypto accounts were controlled by unidentified third parties. So who were the third parties? Were these friends, family members? Was was it some kind of nefarious scheme that they kind of got sucked them into? I, I, you know, I don't know. I still feel like we don't quite have maybe the entire story of what was what was going on there. But, uh, but like I said, it was an update. So I just wanted to, to bring that into everybody. Um, the FDIC's problem bank list spikes to the highest level since the third quarter of 2022. So the FDIC reported that total assets on its problem bank list rose by $15.8 billion to $82.1 billion in the first quarter. The number of banks on the list rose from 52 to 63 during the same period. The percentage that problem banks make up of the total is 1.4%, which the agency said is still within the normal range for non-crisis periods of 1% to 2%. Uh, the total assets and number of banks on the list have been growing for the past three quarters now. We still have a historically high level of unrealized losses across the banking industry and their securities portfolios. Chairman Martin Grunberg told reporters on May 29th, supervisors are also focused on loans on banks' balance sheets and concentrations. The FDIC places a bank on the problem bank list if it has a CAMELS composition rating of four or five. Uh, the CAMEL scale evaluates a bank's capital adequacy, asset quality, management, earnings, liquidity, and sensitivity. The scale goes from one to five with five representing the worst status. Um, 
Yeah, I, you know what? I probably need to do a whole episode on camels, uh, the camels rating, because that's something that I think a lot of people do not really know anything about because it is a secret um, rating. It's a rating that is just between you, the bank, not you, the, the bank is between the bank and the federal regulators. And that's it. It's not it's not a rating that gets that never gets disclosed to the public until until after the fact of probably there's there's a problem. But um more times than not, this is a rating that's kept secret. Like, like as a, uh, if you are working in a bank and you are told what the camel ratings is, you, you cannot disclose that information. Like that is absolutely confidential information. You cannot disclose that to anyone outside the bank. That's, it's a very, very serious thing. So, uh, but I'll, I'll, like I said, I'll do a whole episode on that, but I think, but I wanted to point out here that, you know, the fact that the, the, the list is, growing it's increasing i think that is is not a a good trend while while they are correct the numbers are within historical norms of norms of just the 1.2 percent overall you know kind of problem issues across the entire banking industry but it is like i said it's just something to keep an eye on and they they hit the nail right on the head the problem is the bank bond portfolios are still tremendously underwater and it's still a it's a major major problem um okay uh, JP Morgan's CEO, uh, basically Jamie Dimon, uh, likened JP Morgan Chase's company to an elite military unit with an ingrained culture and capabilities that will endure once he steps down from the job. The 60 year old executive who has served as CEO for nearly 20 years has recently put boundaries around when the succession process might happen, saying at the bank's investor day that the timetable is not five years anymore. That could be four years, it could be three, it could be three and a half could be four and a half. It could be two and a half. It's up to the board. He said at an investor conference, May 29th, he said the bank has a strong bench of potential successors and structures in place that will enable it to continue to perform well. Um, my guess is two years. My guess is two. He's 68. My guess is two years when he's 70. He's done. Uh, basically, they probably already have the plan in place. They probably already know who's going to be taking over. They just haven't announced it yet. I mean, banks, especially big banks, I mean, when they do these succession things, they like to do them very methodically over as long, kind of a long a period as they can, normally over a couple of year period of time. Um, you never want to do it quick. You never want to do it within like a couple months or something like that. It's always, it needs to be very planned out and very orchestrated. Um, yeah, you got to telegraph a lot of this stuff to the market. It's just, just how these things are done. Uh, Jamie Dimon, no doubt is an absolute a legend in the banking business. Um, you know, the, 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 the guy just has accomplished so much in his career. Um, I'll probably do, I got a great book on Jamie Dimon, a couple, actually a couple books on Jamie Dimon and kind of his career and stuff like that. And, and I, I would definitely be, uh, I think a pretty cool episode one day to, to kind of talk about his career and, and, and kind of how he got to be, how he got to JP Morgan, how he got to be the CEO, what it kind of happened there. Um, you know, really interesting guy, really extraordinary guy. Display again, whether you like him, don't like him, whatever, the guy, like I said, the guy will be a legend in the banking business. The banking, you know, books will be, you know, he'll be talked about for many, many, many years to come. He's had just that kind of career. Um, you know, so, so like I said, so interesting. So just things to keep an eye at. Um, it could be a cool summer for the U.S. economy, inflation reports suggest. So a report on consumer spending and inflation showed incomes aren't keeping up with prices as consumers lost buying power in April. Consumer spending decelerated, suggesting people are cutting back as price pressures uh, household budgets. Uh, businesses may become reluctant to raise prices as their customers become more budget conscious, economists uh, said. So, yeah, so basically I'll have a little bit more on that in just a minute in terms of some of those numbers. But uh, the consumer basically is is tightening that belt uh, as the inflation is just really starting to hammer people. Uh, tamer inflation in April revives hopes for interest rate cuts. So inflation was relatively tame in April in line with forecasters expectations and encouraging sign for the prospect of a possible interest rate cut by the Federal Reserve later in the year. The Fed, which has been keeping rates uh, keeping rates high to stifle inflation, could get breathing room for rate cuts if cooler inflation persists for several months. Financial markets are uh, pricing in better than a 50% chance of a rate cut by September. So, yep, we shall, uh, we shall see. Uh, I've kind of talked a lot uh, about basically how the Fed is in quite the pickle. 
Um, if they cut interest rates, they run the risk of inflation spiking back up. I do not believe, and I've said this many times, inflation is not going back to 2%. You know, inflation has been hovering around, you know, high twos, low threes, like kind of that 2.8 to 3.4% range. Um, I think that's where inflation remains. Um, you know, and the Fed runs the risk if they cut rates you know, kind of too quickly and too much, they run the risk of reigniting in inflation, which would be far worse, far worse than if they just leave the rates where they're at. So, I, you know, it, it is a conundrum because because basically the the market will, uh, if the market does deteriorate, again, that's not necessarily a bad thing. It's kind of what you want because you need to, you truly need to beat that inflation down. And if you beat the inflation down, that means the market's got to kind of deteriorate and unemployment's got to go up. Um, and, but, but in the long run that in the short run, that's a bad thing in the long run. That's a good thing. I think the worst thing that the fed could do is repeat its mistakes from the 1970s, which is basically cut rates too soon. And then you have this massive spike up in inflation, which just, you know, which just will will absolutely bury the consumer. And that's and that's kind of game over at that point, because now the Fed would be forced to to go right back and jack the rates right back up. And now you're talking about a Paul Volcker situation where they might have to rate raise rates up to nine, 10, 12, 15 percent to finally beat back and get that inflation back down. And you may be looking at a a horrible recession, like a 1980, 1981 type recession, um, which would be, which would be, again, which would be very, very bad for the country. Okay. So, all right. So let's get into some news here. Some other news rather. Uh, Canner Fitzgerald, uh, Canner Fitzgerald Securities filed a lawsuit against IT Conversion Inc. for alleged extortion. Bloomberg News reported, uh, IT Convergence has hosted some of Cantor's most critical and sensitive data since 2013, but its contract expired in mid-2024. According to the complaint, Cantor planned to migrate its data, including financial books and records for the firm and affiliates from IT Convergence to an Oracle platform starting June 1st. However, IT Convergence demanded an immediate wire transfer of more than 700000 in invented costs and fees that Cantor never owned and did not cooperate with the transition process, Cantor alleged. So interesting situation there. Uh, the FDIC has terminated the special committee it formed in late 2023 to oversee an independent third-party review of the agency's workplace culture. Uh, the special committee was terminated effective May 30th following the completion of the review that was conducted by Cleary, Gottlieb, Steen, and Hamilton. Uh, the review found that the FDIC failed to provide a workplace safe from sexual harassment, discrimination, and other interpersonal misconduct for far too many employees and for far too long. Um, but yet Martin Grunberg still has not resigned. If you, if you go back to last week, I did an episode called the FDA, so called chaos at the FDIC. So if you're not familiar with this story and what's been happening with the FDIC, please go back and check out that episode. Um, but I will keep everybody updated on what happens there at the FDIC. And as that continues to unfold, uh, the CFPB launched a public inquiry into junk fees that are increasing mortgage closing costs. Uh, the CFPB's request for information seeks input from the public, including borrowers and lenders, about how mortgage closing costs may be inflated and constraining the mortgage lending market, among other things. The CFPB wants information on which costs have increased most in recent years and the reasons for such increases, including the rise in costs for credit reports and credit scores. So that's a very interesting one because, yes, I... I would have a tendency to say that I think closing costs for, for buying a property or even selling a property are, are way too high. Um, however, the cost, the question becomes like, well, what are you going to bring down? You know, the title company has its fees. Realtors have their fees. The bank has their fees. Um, you know, everybody's got their cost. Of, there's Everybody's got their cost of doing business, you know, and if, and if prices have gone up, you know, if the cost of credit reports has gone up, if the cost of appraisals have gone up, if the cost of title insurance has gone up, if the bank's fees have gone up, it's all been because of inflation. Uh, you know, the inflationary pressures have pushed the cost of all this stuff up. Um, you know, so again, kind of interesting thing to think about there. Uh, definitely merits probably a little more conversation. Anyway, 
Visa and MasterCard agreed to pay a $197 million fee to settle a class action lawsuit alleging the company's ATM network rules caused millions of consumers to pay artificially high amounts of access fees since 2007, Reuters reported. Uh, Visa will pay $104 million and MasterCard will pay $98 million in the settlement and the defendant's earlier settlement claims for uh, $66 million, the report said. Two other related cases are reportedly pending in Washington in D.C., the federal court. So uh, Visa and MasterCard ripped a whole lot of people off. I'm shocked. Just I can't believe it. Couldn't believe that they would do something like that. Uh, <laughs> anyway, uh, big U.S. banks exposure to commercial real estate risks could be higher than regulators appreciate. As a significant part of the CRE exposure is indirect via credit line provision to real estate investment trusts or REITs, which tend to utilize credit lines higher than non-financial corporations and other non-banking financial institutions during wider stress in the economy, according to a new study. Researchers said regulators must incorporate this exposure in bank capital stress tests. Interesting, okay. The U.S. banking industry reported aggregate net income of $64 billion in the first quarter, an increase of $28.4 billion, or 79.5% from the previous quarter, due to large banks not realizing billions of dollars toward the FDIC uh, Corp's special assessment, which drove down bank profits at 2020-23 year-end, according to an FDIC report. The regulator said a large decline in non-interest expense, $22.5 billion, or 13.3%, was the primary cause of the profit increase, and a decline in special assessment costs accounted for more than half of the decrease in those expenses. So, um, the banking crisis last year in which four banks failed, uh, basically the FDIC came out and said that they had to do a special assessment on larger banks, I think banks over $10 billion, um, in order to replenish the FDIC fund, and that is what that was all about. So the Federal Reserve Bank of Cleveland named Beth Hammock, the next president and CEO. Hammock, who most recently served as co-head of global financing at Goldman Sachs, will succeed Loretta Mester, uh, whose tenure at the Cleveland Fed, uh, Cleveland Fed will conclude on June 30th. Royal Bank of Canada said it is launching its Truth and Reconciliation Office under its new Indigenous Banking Strategy Team called RBC Origins. Wow, I could not. That's the, the Ministry of Truth from 1985, 1984. Sorry, <laughs> 1984. Uh, wow, how, how Orwellian can you possibly get? Uh, BlackRock's iShares Bitcoin Trust is now the world's biggest Bitcoin exchange traded fund, garnering $19.68 billion in total assets since its U.S. listing on January 11th. Uh, Bloomberg News reported BlackRock's ETF overtook Grayscale Investments Bitcoin Trust, which has $19.65 billion, the news outlet noted, adding Fidelity Investments Bitcoin ETF is the third largest with over $11 billion in assets. Uh, FTX trading executive Ryan Salam, if I'm saying that right, Salam got a seven and a half year jail sentence for conspiring to make illegal political contributions and operate an unlicensed money transmission business, the Wall Street Journal reported, citing the ruling of U.S. District Judge Lewis Kaplan. Uh, Salam is the first associate of F FTX founder Sam Bankman Free to be sentenced, according to the report. So, yeah, he got sentenced for conspiring to make illegal co political contributions, which, of course, the federal uh, prosecutors decided not to prosecute Sam Bankman Freed because they didn't want the news to come out for all of the money that he was donating to all the political parties and all the money he was laundering back for all the kickbacks out of Ukraine for all the politicians. Didn't want to talk about any of that. Couldn't couldn't have couldn't have that come out. Um can't expose the grift, ladies and gentlemen. You can't expose the grift. Okay. Uh, Commodity Futures Trading Commission member Christine Johnson is a leading contender for the top post at the FDIC. Bloomberg News reported, citing an unnamed source, Johnson has been in recent talks with White House officials about the role, according to the report. So again, a little bit more information on the FDIC there. So they're, they're looking to see if they can nominate uh, Kristen Johnson to replace Martin Grunberg, uh, which again would be a good thing because like I've said before, Mr. Martin, um, time to exit stage right. 
Uh, the FDIC court failed, and uh, some more some more information here, failed to timely report several av- allegations of misconduct involving senior officials to the agency's inspector general. Uh, FDIC inspector general Jennifer Fain wrote in a memo to FDIC chair Martin Grunberg a- on May 23rd. As is obviously no shock there. It's a, it's a hot mess over there at the FDIC right now. Uh, The U.S. Treasury Department has eased rules on U.S. sanctions against Cuba, now allowing Cuba private sector entrepreneurs to open, maintain, and remotely use U.S. bank accounts, including through online payment platforms. U.S. banks may again also process so-called U-turn fund transfers for Cuban people, including private Cuban, Cuban businessmen, as the Biden administration reinstated authorizations for such transactions after these were halted in September of 2019. Okay. TD Bank dismissed more than a dozen employees to address the shortcomings of its anti-money laundering program in the U.S., which led to regulatory scrutiny for the company, the Wall Street Journal reported. Citing a person familiar with the matter, the company took action against certain leadership in the anti-money laundering function and the U.S. bank branch employees who breached the bank's internal code of conduct, the unnamed source told the news outlet. In the company's first quarter earnings call, President and CEO Bharat Masrani Uh, said the company took action, including terminations, against responsible employees as part of its internal investigation, but did not disclose specific information. In light of the issue, bank executives are also not able to provide definitive answers to questions about its U.S. expansion plans. TD's U.S. retail bank head, um, Salam, uh, said the company is not yet able to provide clarity on the matter amid ongoing talks with regulators, according to to a transcript of the call. So yes, TD Bank has got a lot of problems there with their anti-money laundering program, found out they were funneling a lot of money for nefarious activities, and uh, I'm sure more information to come there. So uh, MoneyGram International missed the deadline on a $398 million leverage loan deal as it failed to convince lenders to lower the borrowing costs on the loan, which matures in 2030. Bloomberg News reported, citing people with knowledge of the matter, a group of banks led by Goldman Sachs Group is attempting to lower the interest rate margin on the loan to as low as 400 basis points over the benchmark rate, according to the report. So yeah, MoneyGram uh, having some problems there is they cannot roll the debt. If you're watching my Lords of Easy Money series, uh, which just concluded last week, by the way, but if you go out, if you watch that series, you'll understand we talk about in that series again and again, the roll. We call it the roll, the rolling of the debt for all of this corporate debt, government debt, the roll. And all of these companies like Money Grand Inc. are going to get buried by the roll. Um, okay. New York-based digital letter Ampla LLC is looking for a buyer and said last week that it plans to lay off half its employees. New York Times reported, citing two people familiar with the firm's finances, the firm faces pressure from its lenders, including one that has stepped in to examine the company's loan book after the firm breached a condition of its borrowings, according to the report. Uh, U.S. House of Representatives passed a CBDC Anti-Surveillance State Act, which prevents unelected bureaucrats from issuing a central bank digital currency without explicit authorization from Congress. The bill was introduced by Majority Whip Tom Emmer. Uh, That is a great, great thing. And I just pray and I hope that, you know, the Senate will pass it and that the president will sign it. Um, I have a slim hope of that. But anyway. uh, okay. so what's some of the other stuff going on? Uh, GDP got revised down slightly, uh, got revised down from, um, let's see here, it got, re- it got uh, revised down to 1.3% from, I think, the 1.6%. Um, pending home sales dropped in April. Pending home sales decreased 7.7%, according to the National Association of Realtors. Um, we talked about, you know, uh, community bank net income. I'm going to probably talk about that when I talk about, I'm going to do an episode on the FDIC just just released their quarterly banking profile report. I did, I did that a couple months ago and I'll, I'll cover this quarter. So the SEC warns investors about crypto fraud. The Securities and Exchange Commission issued an investor alert on how fraudsters use crypto assets to lure victims to hide their identities, uh, which makes recovering stolen funds more difficult. Yeah, I guess it, guess it would. Treasury issues risk assessment risk assessment on NFTs. The Treasury Department published its first risk assessment on non-fungible tokens. The background non-fungible tokens or NFTs are unique digital identifiers that are recorded using distributed ledger technology and may be used to certify authenticity 
and ownership of an associated right or assets such as digital image. Okay. OCC revamps financial inclusion project. The OCC's hue calls for extending recovery guidelines for more banks. Um, home prices reported an annual gain of 6.5% in March. The Federal Housing Finance Agency of house prices rose 0.1% in March over the prior month and was up 6.6% over the past year. Consumer confidence index rose in May after three consecutive months of decline. Uh, the Bowman, the Fed's balance sheet can be a monetary policy tool and a problem. <laughs> Credit union acquisition demands congressional response. Consumer sentiment drops to the lowest point in five months. So the consumer sentiment dropped 10.5% in the last month. It's lowest reading in five months, according to the University of Michigan index. Um, and then finally, durable good orders grow in April. The Commerce Department reported that new orders for manufactured durable goods increased 0.7% in April, the third straight month of growth. So... Um, Got to keep an eye on that GDP. The government has been basically buying uh, that growth with all of the spending. And once that spending stops or goes out the window, uh, then that's a obviously a, a major problem because the GDP is going to go negative right into the toilet. Um, so, okay, that's, uh, let's see here. Do I have anything else this week before I try to wrap up? Let's see here. Uh, U.S. economy begins to slow. Dollar rally loses steam. U.S. bank margins contract at faster pace in quarter one. Um, let's see here. Some liquidity talk. We talk about that. U.S. housing prices continue to scale new heights in March. That asset inflation just rolling along. Commercial real estate loan delinquency growth decelerates again because banks have been selling off their loans. Banks worry Fed interchange proposal will hinder fraud prevention investments. Uh, demand for the Fed's discount window spikes after the bank term funding program sunsets. I might have to do a separate episode on that. Fed frets over loose financial conditions as market rallies. Um Capital, commercial real estate, at center of banks, regulatory scrutiny. And then uh, I already talked about the FDIC, the finance list there. So uh, that's pretty much what I got this week. So, okay. So uh, I just want to wrap up with a couple of things here. So uh, I just finished the Lords of Easy Money series. Uh, episode 21 came out and there are, uh, so there's 21 total episodes in the series. I just finished it last week. So if you have not had a chance to check that series out, I, I beg you, please go check that out. Because if you want to understand what is happening with the economy right now, if you want to understand what the Fed has done, you need to go uh, either read that book or, or just listen to the series. Now, I designed the series in a couple of different ways. So if you want to get the break, I have ever I go over every chapter in depth. I break every single chapter down. There's 16 chapters in the book, break them all down. Uh, so that's one way you can literally listen to the episodes and go chapter by chapter, or there's kind of a quicker, briefer way to review it. So I did three episodes, episode eight, episode 15 and episode 20, where I cover the three parts of the book. So part one was chapters one through six. Part two is chapters seven through 12. And then part three is chapters 13, 14, 15, and 16, the last four chapters of the book. Each one of those episodes that does that, that section review is basically about 30 minutes. So if you, so basically, if you listen to that, you could basically run, get a, get a quick overview of the whole book in basically about an hour and a half. And, but I would also tell people the last episode I did, so the book ends in 2021. And the last episode I did was basically trying to bring us current, you know, tried to look at a lot of numbers. What has happened over the last three years? I, mean, I looked at uh, federal, uh, let's see here, what did I look at? We looked at the Fed's balance sheet. We looked at interest rates in terms of the federal funds rate. We looked at net worth. We looked at the national debt. We looked at the corporate debt. We looked at the repo market. We looked at Fed, the Fed's profits. Uh, we looked at all, so I, I, I threw in a whole bunch of charts and graphs and figures, talked about a lot of stuff. So so um, if, even if you don't, like I said, even if you don't like look at the series, go check out that last episode because I think you'll find it really fascinating and really interesting. So um, 
A lot of other episodes uh, this week. If you didn't get a chance to check it out, I did a great article on, or I did, I did a great article. I did a great review on, uh, do the five C's of credit still matter? I did what is happening with office uh, fit out costs. Uh, what does a good board of directors look like? Uh, some people might find that interesting. I did an update on what's happening with the banks in Europe. So I haven't, haven't really reported a lot on what's going on with our, our European uh, brothers and sisters overseas, but I uh, figured I'd give a, a quick update on kind of some of the things that are happening with that. So, uh, you know, definitely go on. Uh, please go on and go, you know, check out some of the other content on the channel. Now that the Lords of Easy Money series is over, I'm going to be looking to probably put together some other special series. I might look at some historical things, kind of like maybe big events of the 20th century, as far as like Bretton Woods, the establishment of the Federal Reserve, uh, Nixon taking us off the gold standard, uh, things like that, uh, that hopefully people will find uh, very interesting. Uh, I'm also got, you know, again, got, got a, uh, looking to have a bunch of interviews uh, coming up here over the next two months. So more stuff to come. Uh, now, next week, I, I'm still not sure what I'm going to do next week. I, I will probably have a few episodes coming out. I'm not sure if there's going to be a banking update next week because um, starting next week, going through to the following week, I am going to be teaching down at uh, bank school. I'm going to be at the Stonier Graduate School of Banking uh, doing my doing my annual uh, kind of uh, duty and doing my things there for five days uh, this week, going from from uh, basically Thursday through to next Tuesday, um, the 11th. So uh, so so for all the people at Stony Air, hopefully maybe I'll see some of you down there on uh, on the University of Pennsylvania's campus. Uh, if not, I, I might try to experiment with some things. I might try to shoot some videos there and put them up later, or I might, uh, may, who knows, maybe I might actually live stream something. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, if I'm feeling brave uh, one night, uh, but we'll uh, we'll see. Like I said, I'm hoping hoping to maybe experiment with a couple cool things and then bring them to you uh, the week after. So, like I said, next week, not really sure how much I'm going to have out uh, the the you know the next week. So next weekend, which would be probably like the ninth, like eighth, ninth. I'm not sure, like I said, not sure how much I'm going to have coming out next weekend, but. Uh, the week after that, I'll be back. I'll have some more episodes for everybody, and I'll kind of report on uh, kind of what was going on at Stony Air with the vibe and everything there. And, uh, and like I said, so hopefully, hopefully I can come up with some creative things, some cool things to share with everybody. But that's all I got for today. I hope everybody has a wonderful weekend. I hope your week coming up is excellent and uh, stay safe out there. And remember, if you like this, please make sure to like, share, and subscribe. That always helps the podcast. Please check out thebankernextdoor.com. We are on YouTube, Rumble, and all major podcast platforms. Please make sure to leave your comments down below. I love getting back to everybody, and I will see everybody again real soon. Thanks a lot. <laughs>